And so we, we come to um, chapter 8, right? And we're just going to do a very quick uh, recap, okay? That uh, of the last message that I preached, right? The king and Haman attended the uh, banquet, the second banquet that Esther had invited them to, right? And it's during that uh, banquet, the king asked Esther, right? Tell me what is your petition? Whatever it is, I will grant it to you, even unto half of the kingdom. Now, at that point, she then said, okay, she pleaded for her life, right? Uh, said, you know, she and her people are sold to, to be destroyed and to, to die. And the king was like, who, who, who would have done that? How can someone imagine to do this kind of terrible thing? And that was when she exposed Haman for his devious and heinous plot, right? He was exposed, right? Uh, the king was upset, he was angry. Haman was, you know, uh, panicking, pleading for his life. He fell onto the couch there where Queen Esther was. The king came back in. So happened. Now, again, you see this over and over again, this so-called coincidence. He so happened to see, right, Haman on the couch, right, trying to plead with Esther. And the king is thinking, what? Is he going to now sexually assault my wife? What? what? You know, the, and she's the queen. How dare he? Whatever. And what happens? As soon as that happened, right, the king spoke aloud. His servants came. They took Haman away, right, back, put a bag over his head. And then someone said, oh, by the way, Haman has built a gallows. And the king said, oh, how nice, how convenient. Let's hang him there, right? In, right, think about this, right? This is in Haman's own backyard or front yard on his own property in his home, right? He built this thing to... Uh, all right, for the purpose of executing Mordecai. Okay, the, this man who thought, right, he was so powerful, right, he could have to get away with anything, do whatever he wants. He doesn't have to account for to, to anybody, right? Um, and guess what? Now everything falls apart, right? Everything reverses just in that very instance. And his plot is exposed. He is killed, right? But we need to continue because there is more. Because when you, I want, and, and as we deal with chapter 8, I want us to realize something here, okay? That throughout chapter 8 and actually throughout the book of Esther, now there are certain parallels, right? And pictures and shadows of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Seen in the character of Esther and also Mordecai, okay? So I want you to get, just plant that, I just want to plant that thought at the back of your head, right? Because then as we deal with this, we're going to make some observations. Now, some of that we've actually dealt with previously already, but we will eventually, I think I have to do a full recap of all the, the whole book of Esther to see those pictures and types and shadows, right? And these are found, like I said, in the person of Esther and Mordecai. And also, think about this, right? As we deal with this now, what, what does Haman represent? Okay, because there, there's also, right? And so today I want to talk about, right, when... God now steps in to deal with the enemies, right? What happens? And beginning with the first point, right? There was power over the enemies. Now, the tables have turned upon the death of Haman. Verse 1, on that day did the king Ezra give the house of Haman, the Jews' enemies, unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her, right? So what happens now? After Haman was hanged, all his assets, all his property, and all that was seized, right, by the king's crown, right? And now the king actually hands that over to Esther. Okay? And you think about this, right? The, um, that Haman, all that, he was prepared to actually pay blood money, actually, for killing all the Jews. Now, guess what? All this, right, all that Haman has now belongs to the queen, right? But at this point, the queen also makes it very clear what her relationship is with Mordecai, right? Because uh, apparently up to this point, it was not actually made very clear and probably Mordecai kept quiet about it. Now, which is interesting because you consider, right? Mordecai as the older cousin of Esther, uh, and yet he was like a father unto her. Now, he wields a lot of influence, okay? But interestingly, what you can see here is that Mordecai up to this point had not played his uh, connections. He has never... Now, the only time he used that was uh, in the earlier chapter when he informed Esther about the plot to assassinate and kill the king. Okay? Now, 
because why is that important? Because now today we we see this right. If someone is connected to somebody else, immediately what do we do? We, we, we smell something bad. Now here, what you're going to notice is Mordecai never used this for personal gain. You get what I'm saying here? Just because you know someone, you you're connected to someone, whatever, doesn't automatically make it bad, right? It's question now is this how do you use it here Mordecai never used it to like oh you, know, you know make himself rich or famous or, or you know get himself promoted uh instead what did he do to save lives right the, the life of the king and so now Esther makes it very clear right he is my older cousin right and now the king knows also his queen is a Jew and same for Mordecai right the man who saved the king's life and it's very interesting. He is the king as well as is actually okay with her being a Jew. You know, because sometimes uh you know when someone you know we we are sometimes afraid to reveal something about our past. Right? Because uh there's always a fear that oh if some if everybody knows uh, what happened to me before or whatever, okay, I don't know. Let's say uh you know, before I was a teenage terrorist or something like that, you know, maybe everyone will shun me. Now here, um the king was okay with this, but now that Haman is dead. What happens? His position is vacant, is now. And so the king promotes, right, Mordecai, right, into that position. Now look at verse 2. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. So he, now this ring was given to Haman by the king. And now that Haman has been executed, now he takes this and presents it to Mordecai instead. This ring is what that ring and the seal of the of authority okay because with that ring now what happened what has been happening now this Haman who had that ring up to this point law after law right was signed and sealed in the king's name by Haman think about that right if someone has the power to just sign all sorts of laws and decrees right in the king's name and whether the king knows what's going on or not is, is not clear. But if the ring is in Haman now, in Haman's possession, right? You realize Haman can do anything he wants? Is that right? It's like the king passing, you know, to one of us a checkbook where all the checks are already signed. Okay? Now, here's the thing. You want to know what someone is really like? You give them absolute power. You'll see their true colors. Okay? And the problem is this. In this world, and because of the sin nature of man, the majority of people can never be trusted with absolute power. You know why? It corrupts us. Right? The temptation when you can do anything you want. Okay? Most people will fall far short. But what we see here is this in verse 2, right? This same power and authority is now handed to the right person. Okay, Mordecai. And then you notice, all that was seized, right, uh, that belongs to Haman, now is handed uh, by Queen Esther over to Mordecai to decide what he wants to do. So now, now Mordecai has the same authority and position as Haman, right? Remember, this same ring was the one that was used to sign and seal the law, which was the order to exterminate all the Jews. Now, Mordecai is promoted. Okay, we see the promotion of Mordecai. And in Esther 3 verse 1, we see that uh, when, when Haman was promoted, now he was set as a ruler above all the princes of the kingdom. Right After these things, did King Ezra promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, Amadatha, the Agagai, and advanced him, notice, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. Right? And so we see Mordecai was now promoted, in other words. He is now the replacement, right, to, of Haman. And he is now set, right, above all the princes in all the provinces, right? He is the highest, holding the highest position there in the land, right? And in other words, the second highest position. Right? He's second only to the king. Now, is there a parallel to this? Because uh, we look at uh, Genesis chapter 41, verse 42 and 43, 
We see that happen with Joseph, right? And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him, notice, in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he made him ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt, right? So Joseph was uh, promoted second only to Pharaoh. Guess what? Mordecai, in like fresh manner now weapons, he's second only to King Ezraus. Wait, hang on. Remember I talked about the parallels? What was the parallel? Right, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? In submission to the Heavenly Father, right? He uh he is under the Father's authority, second in command, and yet all power, all authority is under him. Am I correct? Okay. In all these examples, one of the other things you're going to see is this. You don't see uh, the thing that we that's so common today. Uh, where's the check and balance? You don't see that. You know why? Each of these, their character. Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The Son of God, uh, Mordecai, and Joseph. You know what? These were men, right? Of very solid character that they can be entrusted with this. Now, as I mentioned just now, it is not for everyone. And, and to be honest, I don't know. Let's say if I were in that situation, right? How would I wield that power? Good question. I hope I never have to be tested in that way. All right? And here, all the assets and the property of Haman, the house of Haman, now, now handed over to Mordecai. Now, Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7. I want to see something here because this is a total reversal now from Haman, uh, from Mordecai from being right this humble servant. Now, remember, one moment he was wearing sackcloth and ashes. Now, he is elevated, right, to the highest position that anyone can have except being the king, right? And Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7 tells us this, For promotion cometh neither from the west, nor from, uh, neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. Okay? But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. God is the one that can elevate, raise us up. But beware, because you know when we start to get it to our heads, we think that we are somebody or something. You know, God can also bring us down. Right? Now, the psalmist... In Psalm 37, note that, right? Observe, you know, how, how does God, right? That was, you know, we see the wicked and when they prosper and we wonder sometimes, it discourages us. Okay? We see that, right? The nation of the nation, sometimes people look around and say, you know, their leaders and the, uh, the you know, their leaders, the politicians are corrupt, however, they enrich themselves at the expense of the people, so on and so forth, and people get very angry and frustrated. Right? But here, notice Psalm 37, verse 32. It says, The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. Right? The wicked, they watch for the opportunity to slay, to kill somebody. Right? Uh, and they think, they, what's going on in their minds is they think they're going to get away with this. But it says, The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Right? Because the righteous, God is going to be there to intervene. He's not going to leave him in the hands of the wicked. Right? He's not going to allow just the, the, the righteous to be condemned or be, to be judged. So verse 34 says, wait on the Lord and keep his way. Continue to do what's right, to continue to do what's good. It says, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When will that happen? It says, when the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. There will be a day when God steps in to deal with things, right? And it says, when that day comes in, you'll be around to actually see that happen. Here it says, I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. All right, so apparently this green bay tree, right, spreads out its branches and then, you know, expands outwards. You know, here the wicked are growing in their power, expanding and expanding kind of like a virus. Okay, but notice, yet he passed away. And lo, he was not. He's gone. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Just like that. Do you realize that when God has to step in, deal with this, now with the wicked, now they can be here today, gone tomorrow. However, 
big shot they may be, however famous they may become, right, or powerful or influential, that's good. Said they're not. Cannot be found anymore. Just like that. Okay? Now, so far so good. It sounds like, okay, well, there's good news, right? Uh, Haman is gone. You know, it's like people will celebrate, ah, the wicked witch is dead. Now, but there's more. Because there is still the problem of the existing law. Am I correct? Because there's still outstanding matters to address. Now look at verse 3 and 4. And Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagai and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Okay, so what happens now? Esther comes before the queen, right? She prostrates, uh, prostrates herself in humility to plead for her people. Right, and she pleads with the king, please put away Haman's evil plot. Okay, she comes with that purpose to bring this before the king. Notice verse 4, right? She appears not just at the out, 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 outside of that court there, and again, the same rules apply, right? Unless the king holds out the golden scepter, whoever approaches to the king and does not win, have his favor, they get executed. Now, she comes to plead. She's willing, notice, to sacrifice and lay down her life for the sake of her own people. Said so the king, verse 4, and then the king held out the golden scepter towards Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king. So she comes, she brings her petition before the king. Now, there's a parallel here because notice, she takes on the role of intercessor. Right? An intercessor is someone who pleads on somebody else's behalf. We have examples of this, right, throughout the scriptures. Okay, I actually didn't list out all of them, but here's a few. Moses was willing, right, to actually sacrifice himself, to have his name blotted out, right, from the book of life, right, for the sake of Israel. Why? Because they had sinned. Look at Exodus 32, verse 31 and 32. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin. Now, think about this, right? The situation Moses pleads on behalf of the people. Now, did Moses sin this way? No. Right? He was up on Mount Sinai, right? Getting um, right, the law of God on on. Uh, tablets of stone, the people were the ones. Now, what happens? He's pleading on their behalf. Right? He's innocent of this, but notice, he says this, and if not, block me, I pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written. Now, it says, if you are not willing to forgive, then block me out of your book. Now, does that sound familiar? Because who was the one willing to lay down his life for the, because of the sins of other people? The Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Romans 9 verse 2 and 3. Paul, the apostle Paul was willing to be a cursor for the salvation of the Jews. Right? Look at nine, uh, chapter 9 verse 2, 2 and 3. It says, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Right? His pain. Note this. If, if they could be saved just by following the law of Moses and all the, you know, following all the feasts and, all the, and offering the sacrifices, why does Paul have to plead? Why is he burdened about the salvation of his own kindred? Because the law can only diagnose your sin problem. It cannot save you. Okay? The commandments of God... Okay, we'll only prove one thing. We are all condemned as sinners. And here the Jews, right, instead use this to work their own righteousness according to Romans chapter 10. But here it says, For I could, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. Okay, now, I was going to take note uh, a few things here. No? You look at these verses, it, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Now, in these two verses, what did Paul point out? My brethren, right? Fellow Jews. What's he saying? Are lost. Paul, you're so unkind. Huh? 
He's so hateful. No, he's saying, he's pointing out a truth. They are lost. They need to be saved. And he says, I wish I could be accursed from Christ for the sake of them, right? For their sake, so that they could be saved. If he could lay down his life, right? Or, and his soul, his eternal soul to be condemned. If, and in that, if, if it were possible, in that process, they could be saved. You know what? He would have gladly done so. But notice something. He has to point out a very uncomfortable, unpleasant truth. They are not saved. Now, if you turn to chapter 10, the same thing. He talks about what his prayer for Israel is, is that they might be saved. Why? Because they had established right their own righteousness, substituting that for the righteousness of God. In fact, they did have no need for the righteousness of God. Can you imagine that? That's a rejection of the gospel. That's a rejection of the righteousness of Christ. Right? Why? Because they thought, I can be good enough, I can be a good person, I can do good deeds and, and good works, whatever, I can be saved, because why? I follow all the laws of Moses. Guess what? The law actually points out, you can never do it. Right? Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, He also is seated at the right hand of, uh, of God's throne as your advocate and mine, as the intercessor for our sins. Now, First John 2, verse 1 and 2, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Right? So he is our advocate, right? He is the one who's pleading on our behalf as your defense lawyer and mine in God's courtroom. Right? Whenever we sin, because why? each time he points out one very important piece of fact and evidence, hate. This is already paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. Settle. All right? Hebrews 7, verse 24 and 25. But this man, because he continued forever, right, as our great high priest, had an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able to he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Notice, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. All right? So he pleads, not because of your righteousness of mine, but because of Christ's righteousness. That was the full payment, settled, done deal, right? Case closed. As your advocate and mine, he comes before the, the king of kings, right? Before God's throne, he's in the argues. This is settled. Now, Esther comes before the king now to petition, right? For a solution to reverse the law passed by Haman. But this is tricky because of the law of the Medes and Persians. Why? We remember when we dealt with this previously, the laws of the Medes and Persians, once you pass that as law, it cannot be changed. Why? Because they believe when the king passes that law, the king is divine, right? He, he is a god. And because he is a god, now think about the, the how, that's why how crazy these arguments these are, right? That if this person, this human being is a god, Therefore, they are perfect. Therefore, they do not make mistakes. And if they do not make mistakes, then why should, why should there be a provision to change the law? They don't make mistakes. Okay? We still have organizations like these also. There are those who claim that they are infallible. Right? Uh, whether they are okay, false teachers, right? uh, organizations, right? uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance. Okay, I know because I, I was formerly a JW before I got saved. They claim to be perfect, infallible. They don't mis make mistakes. And yet, when you look at their publications, take a look at the bottom, right, at the inside page, at the front or whatever. Do you know that there are standard books that they use for Bible study? Probably now are in the 100 and something or 200 and something edition. If it's perfect, why do you keep having to update it? You only need to have the first edition, that's it. Right? Why did they have to replace the Bible that they printed and published, right? Which I managed to track down on eBay was the King James Bible, which refutes their doctrines. They actually refused their doctrines. Then they had to replace it in the 1950s with their New World Translation. Which they said was superior. Now, if they're superior, then why on, why on earth are you claiming to be an infallible 
organization because obviously this to them this there was some sort of progressive thing and, 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 and progressive improvement. Okay? Did you see the fallacy when humans and human organizations claim infallibility? There are serious problems. Here, what happens? Now, this law, right? So Esther comes before the king, says, verse 5, and said, If it please the king, and, and, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes. Wow. She, there's a lot of things here. The, the queen kind of lays it out, right? She's got all her bases covered, right? If it please the king, right? If I have found favor in your sight, right? If this matter is right in your eyes, and then just to make sure, right? This, and if I be pleasing in your eyes. So I can imagine the queen, you know, she probably, well, she really dressed up and uh, got her hair done all nicely, whatever, so that she will be pleasing in his eyes. And, well, let's put it this way. Here's one lady who understands how to get onto the good side of her husband. Yeah? She did all that she went and then she asked, made this re request, right? Let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatata, the, I probably added an extra T somewhere, okay, or the, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. Right, so she's requested, can you write some sort of letter or law to reverse the previous decree? Why? Because despite Haman's death and punishment, right, the clock is ticking. The deadline is counting down. Right? It's still that, that X, in other words, it's still over the, the sword, is still over the heads of all these Jews. Now, under the current situation, perhaps Esther, maybe Mordecai can escape this, you know. Maybe. Because they have the king's favor. But what about the rest? Okay? And what you're going to see here is this. Again, both of them in this position of power and favor, what do they do? They use it for the sake of other people. You, you see what I'm saying here? Because what if God puts you and I in a position, right, where we can make a huge impact? What will you and I do? Will it be to make ourselves rich? Right and famous, or will we use it to serve others? Okay, now, so at the appointed time, what happens? This law is going to kick in. Uh, all the Jews will be rounded up and killed and destroyed. Now, I want us to see a parallel here because the Jews here are still under the curse of the old law. Okay, just like uh, before we are saved, you know, we were under that curse. Right, verse 6, she says, For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Right, so she, now, she mentions two things. One, uh, the evil, this, uh, all this bad stuff is going to happen to my people. And then the other thing is to my kindred. So uh, her kindred will refer to what? Relatives? Like, maybe this, will, this law will still apply to Mordecai. Maybe... Queen Esther might be the exception, but what about Mordecai? Right? What about others? <clears throat> so as long as this law exists, there is a problem. And the biggest problem of all is you can't even fix this because the law of the Medes and Persians are such that you cannot alter the decree. In other words, the king cannot just ignore or set aside that law, neither can the king repeal that law. So it's almost like you, you weave yourself into such a tight knot, right? You can't even move. There's no room to move at all. But she pleads for her people as intercessor. Now, I want to see that there is a parallel with regards to our salvation, right? Because God's laws, what happens? Call for the death of the sinner. Right? The soul of the sinner, it shall die. Right? Uh, okay? And what happens is this. Uh, well, there's none righteous. No, not one. Right, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all of us, because of that, we are cursed as under the law. And 
there is a death penalty on every single one of us, right? First Corinthians 15, look at verse 21 and 22. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, everyone from Adam all the way right now to where we are will die or have died already. But then it says, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, all men have been cursed with death because of sin. Now, Romans 5 verse 12 tells us, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Okay? Now, both 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and Romans 5 now makes a connection, right? Where there is sin, there will be death. There's a direct correlation. And here, it says death by sin, and so sin, death passed uh, upon all men for that all have sin. Okay, two things will happen here. One, we're born with a sin nature inherited from Adam, but when we live, what happens? None of us can perfectly fulfill and obey God's laws. We will break at least one of them sooner or later. Okay, and we continue to our lifetime to break more laws. Guess what? We come under the death sentence because of sin. Right, And so this curse of the law is upon all men. Galatians 3 verse 10 and 11 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it's written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, you should study this, you know, make a note of this, because anyone who tells you, right, oh, you and I, we need to follow the Old Testament law, right, Um, you know, uh, Clifton has to uh, follow the, all the dietary laws. You know, you cannot eat pork anymore. You cannot, you know, uh, eat this and that, uh, so on and so forth. Now, the thing is this. You cannot pick and choose. Because here, cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written. You don't get to pick and choose. All right? Every one of these groups that claim that, okay, we follow some of the Old Testament laws, the Jewish laws, the dietary laws, and all that. Now, they pick and choose what they want to follow and when they want to do it. Here, it says, well, if you want to follow, the, the obligation is upon you now that you follow all of it, and if you break one of it, you are condemned and under the curse of the law. Okay? You don't break it even one time. All right? And so here, this law that Haman passed now it applies to all the Jews in the kingdom, right? The curse is of that law is upon them, and everyone, okay, now failure. So here's the thing, right? Just like the oh, okay, this this uh, law in the time of uh, okay of uh, what's that time of Esther. The curse of the law right now is this. Everyone must live and work righteousness. Everyone who thinks that they can depend on their own good deeds must work righteousness perfectly all the time, never failing one single time. Otherwise, failure to do so means death, physical death, and then eternal damnation. Now, here's the problem. We ask for it. Everyone says, I'm a good person. Right, surely God ought to be happy and satisfied with me. I, I will go, you know, I ought to go to heaven. You know, we ask for this, you know. When we ask for this, the thing is this, we don't get to decide what is the passing grade. You see, God is the one that sets the standard, not you and I. Right? I don't go in and say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to uh, graduate, right? High school, um, Tagalog, language. I'm going to get an A for the exam. But I decide on how the grading is going to be done. No, you don't get to decide that. Okay? The standard is an external standard. Today, many people say, but I feel good about myself. You know, I think I'm okay. Sorry, what you think doesn't matter. What God thinks is what matters. Now, here, everyone who thinks they can come to God by being a good person, doing good deeds, right, will bring this curse upon them. Galatians 3 verse... Uh, Okay, 11 and 12, right? But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. 
right? Not by their works. It says, and the law is not of faith. The man that doeth them shall live in them, right? If you do according to the law, you will have to be, you will be required to live according to that all the way, right? And that standard is what? God's perfect standard. You cannot slip one time. And we cannot ignore or set it aside, right? That's why, what happens? Christ had to die to fulfill those requirements for you and I. Right, Galatians 3 again, verse 13 and 14. Christ had redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? Being made a curse for us. Now, notice, he was willing to sacrifice himself. Now, Mordecai, okay, now, Esther was willing to actually sacrifice herself, coming, approaching to the king on behalf of her people. Right? Christ was willing to be a curse for us so that we might be saved. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Right? And he hung on that wooden cross right? for your sins and mine. It says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit, right? referring to the Holy Spirit, through faith. Okay? Now, I'm going to just mention this very briefly. Romans chapter 7, verse 1 to 4, right? We can mark it down, go and read and study it a bit more. But Paul illustrates it this way, right? Concerning the laws of marriage. Now, there's a parallel here. So, now, as long as the, here he talks about uh, in verse 1 and 2, as long as the woman is married to the man, now she's bound by the law to her husband, says, so long as he liveth. Right? She's married to him, so she's bound by the law to him. Now, but if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So what happens if the husband dies, she is no longer married anymore. Okay, she's not no longer bound in that relationship. Now, so what happens? Verse 3 and 4 tells us, right, that so if th this woman now, if she be married to another man while the husband is still alive, she shall be called an adulteress. But if the husband is dead, what happens? She's free from the law. Verse 4 tells us what happens in our case. We are dead to the law by the body of Christ that ye should be married to another. Okay, what happens? When Christ saves us, what happens? We are no longer under the jurisdiction of the law or under the curse of the law. Okay, but for that to happen, to be free of that, right? There has to be a death. Okay, but none of us here are dead. Okay, but what happens? We are in Christ. And because he died, and because we are in Christ, that contract was broken forever. You get what I'm saying here? The contract is, is gone, it's free. Okay, now here, the problem now is this. How do we break this law? Or You can't just break the law, right? In, in, um, okay, that Haman had already passed. So they had to now figure out a different way, right? And so there's permission to counter the existing law. Now, step one was this, right? Step one was accomplished when Haman was uh, killed, right? Executed by hanging. Look at verse 7 and 8. Then the king Ezra said unto Esther, the queen, and to Mordecai, the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Right? First step, done. But more needs to be done. Step two, passing of a new law to protect the Jews. So verse 8 says this, right? Write ye also for the Jews, notice, as it liketh you in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring, for the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. So he's saying, okay, write a new law. Okay, you cannot cancel the old one. You can add a new law. Okay, so... Esther was given the permission and authority to write a new law, right? Seal it in the king's name, all right? So this law now has to be passed. Now, the, so the solution or the remedy is this, to counter the previous law, because you cannot repeal this, you cannot cancel that, right? We see that the law of, Medes and, of the Medes and Persians cannot be changed, right? Even during Daniel's time, Daniel 6, verse 8 and 9, it says, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it cannot be changed, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. And once again, you will see, this in, in that chapter, right, this was set up as a, as a trap 
right? To set up Daniel. Imagine they passed one law just for against Daniel. Man, they must really hate him, right? To go through all the trouble to pass a law to target a specific person, okay? <coughs> now, so it cannot be taken down. Even the king, when he, King Darius, when he found out, he tried to free Daniel, but you know, he was bound by his own law. Okay, now, the only time now this, this kind of thing can work is when you have someone who is all wise, right? Who has all knowledge, who is all wise, who is com all, you know, full of mercy and grace, right? God himself can make and pass those kind of laws without making a mistake, without contradiction. But left to humans, no way. This is going to work. Now, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, right, established this new testament, this new law, this new covenant, and a better testament for us. Now, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6, who also have made us able ministers, notice, of the new testament. So this new testament is not something that uh, someone came up with a title when they decided they're going to print and publish a, a, a Bible here. Okay, this goes back to, okay, uh, these texts. All right, these passages where it talks about, all right, that Christ came to establish a new testament. Okay, not, notice, not of the letter, referring to the law, right, but of the spirit, right, of the Holy Spirit. It's for the letter killer, but the spirit giveth life. Why? Because the law of Moses could never give a person eternal life. But the Holy Spirit of God can. Right, everyone who is born of the spirit, right, is born again. Now, here, so, This New Testament, right, was established by the death of Christ. Now, Hebrews 9, verse 15 and 16. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of that, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under, notice, the first testament. All right? So here, Christ is the mediator of the New Testament. That, that how? Through his death. All right? So that, what? Those who have broken... God's laws, right? The, the, notice the transgressions so that were under the first testament. What happens now? They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance for where a testament is, there must also uh, of necessity be the death of the testator. The one who is going to right, make the testament. Now, this is a covenant. This is a, uh, okay, this testament is a covenant. Okay, and here what happens? Those who are under the first one can now be freed and come under the New Testament. But that was settled by the death of Christ. Okay? That's why, same thing, you jump down to verse 28, all right, Hebrews 9. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. All right? So the second time, is it when we see Christ the next time, what happens? We will see him, right? Uh, without sin, in, in a sinless state, right? Being saved, okay? And what's going to happen is this. When God is going to judge us, it will be by judging the perfect righteousness and the works of Christ, not us. He's our substitute. Okay? He's our substitute, all right? Imagine it's like uh, somebody else showing up at the exam to take my place, all right? To score 100%, right? Uh, if you do that for your driving test, you will get arrested. Okay? But imagine, Jesus Christ steps in on my behalf, right? And he scores 100%. Okay? Because if I score even 99.999%, I still fail. According to God's law. Now, so we see the passing of laws to protect the Jews, right? So the king's scribes were summoned to record this new decree that was passed and to translate it. Verse 9, right, or chapter 8. Then were the king's scribes called at, the, at that time in the third month, that is the month Sylvan, on the 3th and 20th day thereof, right? So on the 23rd of the third month. It says, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews, right? So, so this law was now <coughs> passed and there was instructions given to all the Jews. Right, Mordecai was the one that actually drafted this law. Now, again, someone with absolute power and authority right now, how would they do this? Because many times, um, 
The question will be this, can you and I be entrusted to be fair? All right? To be fair, now, there's been this debate for the last few years, right? Um, many, okay, in the Philippines now, many uh, Baptist pastors started to run for political office. And the arg argument was that, well, if more Baptists are in, you know, a pol in political office, whoever, you know, then uh, we can, you know, make this nation a righteous nation. Now, the problem is this. Can you go in, right, in public office and then be fair to everybody? You know what I'm saying here? Because Mordecai can now, he's, he's actually in a position to pass laws to, so what, to persecute everybody else who is not a Jew. You get what I'm saying? Right? And I will, I will put on record, frankly, I don't trust anybody, not even a Baptist, to be in majority power because what would they do? Especially if in the first place, they, they have no intention of uh, being fair to everybody. Right? Remember what Haman did? He passed a law to exterminate, right? To single out one particular group of people and then to wipe them out, right? Make sure that none of them will exist in the kingdom. Okay, and do you realize after Haman is gone, there will be other Hamans that will rise up? Right? The worst thing would be this. What if Mordecai becomes like another Haman? Okay, unless God puts in place the right people. Right, so here, this law was passed, right? This is commanded uh, to all the, uh, co Mordecai commanded unto the Jews and to the, okay, lieutenants and the deputies and the rulers of the provinces. And this is a very large kingdom. It says, which are from India onto Ethiopia. Wow. From India all the way to Ethiopia in the West. Okay. And 127 provinces, unto every province, notice, according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing, and according to their language. So every group of people, every language there was. Can you imagine the number of translators there are, the scribes? Okay. Man. And there are 127 provinces. It doesn't say that there are 127 uh, people, groups, and languages. Maybe there were more. Okay, each province is you're likely to actually have more than one group. Right? So man, I mean you think about like trying to do subtitles for a TV drama or something. Can you imagine? So and this was now written and signed in King Ezra's er, uh, name, right? Verse 10. And he wrote in the King Ezra's name and sealed it with the king's ring and sent letters by posts on horseback and riders on mules and, and camels and young dromedaries, right? So these are all various forms, uh, various animals uh, that they write on and they will dispatch and bring uh, the letters, right? So these letters were all written, translated, and then sent to the, the each local region, right? Now, what was this law? Look at verse 11. Wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them both little ones and women and to take the spoil of them for a prey now let's break this down a bit because the law was very specific right uh, they were empowered notice firstly with the right to defend themselves right against anyone who will attack assault or to harm them now the law doesn't give them the right to assault anybody Okay, because it can be open to uh, abuse, right? Oh, I don't like Caleb. All right, we'll go over, we'll kill him. Right, after that, we'll take his car. All right, we'll take his house, we'll take his car, his swimming pool, whatever. Now, here, this includes, right? The Notice one thing, you know, it, the use of deadly force against those who seek the destruction of the Jews. But, notice something, it's very specific. This is in self-defense. People who will seek to harm them, okay? They cannot just use this against anybody, okay? This is not licensed to kill. You get what I'm saying here? But I will also note here, it's very interesting that when you look at the Bible now, 
there is nothing against self-defense. Do you remember what happened the night in which uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed? What did he tell the disciples to do? By a sword. But did he tell them to go and uh, you know start killing anybody, everyone? No. Okay, because it, it serves a number of purposes. One is a deterrent, right? It is also uh, for as a defense. Okay. And then should there be a need to, then you know, uh, it will be okay. It will be to use with deadly force. Now, I will make a, a observation here concerning this law, right? This requires the Jews to make a volitional choice. Notice they were told to gather and stand together. Why? For strength and mutual protection. You see, none of us here live ought to live on our own and just to do our own thing. Okay? Now, there is a parallel, parallel here because I immediately think of what? The local New Testament church. Right? Uh, a flock of sheep. Now, they gather together. They band together again for protection. You, you know what the wolves will do? As they chase all the sheep around, whether, now wolves will tag team. They actually work as teams to wear the flock down. And after a while, the weak and the sickly or the dumb, right? They wander off on their own, blah, blah, and they don't know where they've gone. What happens? They will be isolated. They will be the lunch. But those that are banded together, weapons, they're safe. Okay, here, what happens now? They will come together for mutual protection. Now, they have to choose to do this. They have to choose to stand for their lives, right? Because if they stand there and they say, okay, they don't do anything, that's it. They can still die. Because the law does not say that those who are on Haman's side, right, who are against the Jews, are, are forbidden to attack them. All it says that this law says that the Jews now have the right to fight back. Right? They, choose to st they have to choose to stand for their own lives. They have to choose to defend against their own enemies if they were to live. Now, none of this is going to be done for them. But the law, this new law gives them the liberty to stand their ground to fight back. You get what I'm saying here? There, there is a difference. Right? And upon this designated date, right, this law will take effect, right? So verse 12 tells us, upon one day in the provinces uh, in all the provinces of King Azuerus, namely on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Ada. Now, if you didn't notice, right, it's exactly the same date that Haman's law will go into effect, right? Because you see this in Esther 3 verse 13, the same date. Says, and the letters were sent by post in all, in all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Ada, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Now, this law actually makes it such, right? The, the law that Haman passed now is only one day where they basically gave the license to kill all Jews. But the laws uh, that Haman Passed right was to make sure that on that day everyone young or old babies all will be killed. Okay, I don't know whether you it, it sounds familiar because some years back I think Hollywood came out with a series of movies, The Purge. That one day of the year everyone was looking forward to it, where you can do anything you want and you can kill as many people as you like because no one, the police will not catch you. Okay. Imagine Haman came up with this idea first, the purge of the Jews. All right? So on that day now, they are equipped, given, empowered with the right to defend themselves. And God overturns this dev devious and wicked plan right, for mass extermination. Turn this thing around. All right? Look at Psalm 37, verse 14. And 15, the wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Look at verse 15. Their sword shall enter into their own heart. Wow. And their bow shall be broken. Now, again, I want us to think about this, right? The, 
there was the necessity of battle. Right? Because defense and protection are not sufficient enough to stop the enemy. Guess what? After Haman, others will rise up. There will be repeated attempts. There will be repeated, and uh, there will be other enemies. There will be, you know, they're going to come back up and up again. Now, so the only way <coughs> you can secure peace is what? If you destroy the wicked and the violent. Right? You eliminate the threat. Now, that's why, think about this, right? I'm not going to go into this uh, in detail, but when in Ephesians, Paul writes about what? To put on the whole armor of God. Now, you notice one thing. Although most of the items of the armor of God, right, which uh, the Christian is actually issued the, from the moment that they are saved, they issue this st standard equipment. Now, this provides sufficient protection, but we must never forget one thing. There is a purpose to this. What was the purpose? To assault the enemy. That's why we were given offensive weapons. Not just defense, you know, not just personal protection gear. Right? We have offensive weapons. What was that? Right? Turn with me to Ephesians. Um, right? Imagine I'm trying to turn the Bible with my left hand. All right. Now. Ephesians 6 verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Right? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness uh, of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, and so on and so forth. Now, notice the items of the armor, right? It says, Stand therefore having, um, okay, stand therefore having uh, your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, guess what? Your loins are good about, right? Think of this. I'm wearing a belt right now. I'm good about with a belt. Now imagine Roy is wearing, okay? No, because he's wearing a skirt. Now he, he's good about, he, he has to actually tighten around his waist or otherwise it will fall off. Okay? But what is holding it up? The truth. And yet some people say, well, doctrine is not very important. Really? Huh? How can that be? You kind of keep your pants on if, if, if doctrine is not important, right? Your, if you have a skirt, whatever, your loins are not going to be good unless it's with the truth. Okay? And then notice, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, of course, that, you know, this, the largest target on the human body is going to be this whole front section here. And unless you have righteousness, okay, which means... No matter what we face, doing what is right is very important. Right? Here, what else do we see? And having your feet short with the preparation of the gospel of peace, right? What propels us, moves us forward is always bringing the gospel to others. Okay? And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Where doubt will come, where there's uncertainty, where there's anxiety, where there are worries, where there, you know, there's all this, where there's calamity, you know, uh, what happens? The shield of faith. Trusting that what? I know God is in control. I know that He loves us. Right? I know that He knows what is best. Even if I don't understand everything. Now, here it says, and take the helmet of salvation. Okay? The helmet is very important. Right? You ask any gamer and you know what? They're, they're always talking about what? They're trying to score a headshot. That helmet is very important. And, and you know, whether it's a steel helmet or today, we, we, uh, okay, the last one that was ever issued was a Kevlar helmet. Right? So it's very lightweight, but it's, you know, uh, it's actually, with enough layers, it's actually bulletproof. But it's designed to at least deflect so that I don't get a direct, you know, I don't get hurt. Now, your salvation. Because one single shot, right, to that vulnerable part of your body, your head, and it's all over for you. And that's why our salvation keeps us secure. Now, here it says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, has anyone noticed verse 17? Okay, it's not here in your Bible, that it says the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, colon. 
The sentence has not ended yet. Why is that important? Because praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication unto the saints, right, and, and it goes so on and so forth now. Why? Because many times we've been told, right, the sword of the Spirit, right, which is the Word of God, right, the Bible here. Okay, we have this, we have the sword of the Spirit, and that's our offensive weapon. Hey, hang on. Verse 18, you know, when you pray, right, and in the, in the army, in the infantry, one single lone person, even if they don't have a weapon, do you realize that when they get onto their radio set and they call in for artillery fire, guess what? They can rain a lot of death on the enemy. Guess what? When you and I are on our knees crying out to God, right, for prayer, we get, di you know, we get direct support from above, air support. And what happens? Whoa, that individual weapon, right? The sword of the spirit is powerful, but guess what? When you and I call for direct support from heaven, that's even better. And yet, okay, we think, right? Oh, wow, I want to be powerful as a child of God, as a Christian. Why are we missing from the prayer meeting? Okay, not just Wednesday. Let's not just pick on Wednesday, right? Through the week, we neglect right, our direct line and our direct support. Okay, I'm not going to name names. I mean, all of us are equally guilty here. Am I right? Okay, so what happens now? So they would have... Okay, now, why is this important? Because remember we were told, right, that... Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ said, upon this rock, right, referring to himself, his body, I will build my church. And then he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Why would that be the case if we all are all about protection and defense? Because we're going to assault the gates of hell. We're going in, we're going to raid. Why? There are people perishing who need to be saved. And guess what? We're going in. It's hot. It's uncomfortable. This is enemy territory, but we're going in. All right? Now we see the publication of the new decree. All right? Here, this decree was published everywhere. Now, chapter 8, verse 13, the, the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people and that the Jews should be ready uh, against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. Right? Notice they are to make a choice to prepare for that day because no one's going to do it for them. The law in, insofar only gives you the right to defend yourself. You are to take up that responsibility for yourself. You get what I'm saying here? Okay? Realize this. There are the many things that, uh, that you're going to see as a Christian, right? And the word of God, it's up to us to take up. Okay? Now, one parallel I see, uh, go back with me, right, to 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 19 to 20, right? Because King Saul and, and, uh, and in Israel at the time, okay, had a problem, right? Chapter 13, verse 19. Now, there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. Now, this is talking about a blacksmith, right? A blacksmith who can forge uh, metal, right, to make a sword, to make, uh, okay, farming tools who can you know, do all sorts of stuff. Okay? Now, I'm not, talk I'm not talking about someone with the family name Smith, right? There's no blacksmith, right, found throughout all the land of Israel. What why was that the case? Notice, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. You see, how did, notice something, how did uh, the Philistines ensure that, the, that Israel would never be a threat to them during that time? They make sure nobody will ever have a sword. They will disarm the people. Right? Here, no sword or spear. So what happens? But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man, his share, his coulter, his axe, and his metal. Now, they all went down, right, to the Philistines to sharpen all these farming tools, and they were happy with the arrangement. You know why? As long as you, know, you can harvest, you can uh, plow, you can plant, you can, you, know, you can have a harvest. Everyone's making money. Who cares? We're prosperous. Right? 
All they had, right? The only thing they had, verse 21, yet they had a fowl for the metals and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goats. Right? The goat is, okay, it's not a goat. Okay, it's, it's basically a sharp rod that they use, right? When your, uh, your, your carabao is not going to move, you, you poke him on the backside. Right? You give him a, a prod with a sharp stick weapons and then they will move, right? So here they had those things for farming. But notice, so it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and Jonathan, his son was there found. Guess what? When Israel has to, had to stand and go to battle, you know what happened on that day? Nobody had a sword, nobody had a spear. With the exception of King Saul and his son. Okay? I can see a lot of parallels here because um, churches that say, well, you know, the proficiency in, in knowing and handling the word of God, no, I will leave that to all the full-time stuff. No, no, you don't. Here, because what you're going to see, for the men of Israel, right, in this first Samuel chapter 13, it was their individual responsibility to answer the call to battle to defend and to protect their own families and their own people. But guess what? Without the weapons, you can't do it. Why? Because if you don't have equipment, no preparation is possible. Right? There will be no practice. You have no proficiency. Even on that day, if they issue out the weapons, nobody knows what to do with it. They probably hurt one another. Okay? I can imagine if we give uh, Iran Ishan and, and, you know, Caleb a sword and then we're like, wah! Next thing, you know, next thing someone's crying and we got to go send somebody to the hospital because someone hurt themselves. Because you need to have proficiency. You need to actually know what you're doing. And here on that day, none of that was uh, available. Now, here's the thing. I, I see this in churches all the time. People who are spiritually blind and careless, not they say, they come out and say, Pastor, you are overreacting. You're being alarmist. And yet this story, sad story, plays out over and over and over again. Okay, now, I'm just going to uh, speed through this, right? Esther chapter 8, now verse 14. So the poles that rolled upon mules and camels went out being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment and the decree was given at Shushan, the palace. Okay, so the dispatch riders... Um, Okay, went out. Now, this was pressed on. This was published throughout the kingdom in every language. Now, the decree was also announced at the palace. But what is interesting is this, right? Just a very quick thought here. The urgency and the haste and then the, of the messengers. But notice the infrastructure, right? This messaging, they actually had a system for dispatching all these messages. Which, after the Persian Empire came the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire. Now, the Greek Empire left behind a common language and a postal system. When the Romans came, they laid out a road system for which the soldiers could reinforce every part of the king of the empire. But because of that, right now, this was used in the New Testament era to what? For the epistles to actually be forwarded from church to church, right? Letters could be written. They could travel on those roads to get from place to place to preach in city after city, right? To propagate the gospel. Okay? Now, we see the protection by Mordecai, right? Uh, my next point, right? Esther 8 verse 15, right? Mordecai goes from wearing sackcloth and ashes to wearing royal robes given by the king, Right? Esther 8.15, And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white. So the royal colors here was blue and white, right? I think in other, uh, uh, other cultures and empires, you know, sometimes it's, uh, what, gold. You're not, you're not supposed to wear gold or yellow, right? Or red or, or, or what else? Uh, purple, right? Scarlet and purple. Okay, but here, their official royal colors was blue and white. It says, and with a great crown of gold. So Mordecai now has to like wear all this, all, all this bling. Okay, and it says, and with a garment of fine linen and purple. Ah, so you see purple there, right? And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. Now that part was interesting because, now, they, Shushan rejoiced in that a good man Replace Haman. 
right? But notice something. This honor was not something Mordecai took on himself. Remember, he humbled himself with what? Sackcloth and ashes. Yet all this was placed on him. Now, there is a, also a picture here. Now, when you and I are saved weapons, the robes of righteousness, right? Christ's robes of righteousness, now, all those are placed on us. But weapons, all our filthy rags, right, which are our righteousnesses, are placed on Christ. Okay, now he's promoted, right, to be the king second and command Proverbs 27 verse 2, let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth. Right, a stranger and not thy own lips. Uh, anyone remember the time that Haman actually gathered his wife and all his friends and then to tell them how great he is? You notice here, Mordecai doesn't have to do that, right? So now he comes out, the, this time round, right? You, you see Mordecai appear before the king twice, right? One time with sackcloth and ashes. Now he's dressed in the royal robes instead of that of, the, of a humble servant. And they rejoiced that Mordecai replaced Haman, right? There was joy and celebration by the Jews all over. Why? Because now Mordecai is the protector and the savior of the Jews, right? Verse 16, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land, notice, became Jews for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. All right, so... To the point where, you notice, they won new converts. <coughs> right? And there was a deep respect, right? F for all this, for all of them. Now, some very quick parallels, right? Mordecai to Christ. Now, Christ came on earth the first time as what? Born in a manger, born as a servant, humbled himself to die at Calvary, right? Uh, he didn't even have a permanent address or home. He's coming back the second time, right? Uh, in the clouds, whereas in glory is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, to conquer, defeat all enemies, to rule on earth. Now, the first time you see Mordecai, what was he? In sackcloth and ashes. The second time you see him now, in the king's robes, royal robes, right? Uh, I think he was given also, I think, was it the, the camera? Was, was he riding on the king's chariot? All right. Uh, he was even honored. Remember, brought out throughout the city right riding on the on the okay now remember who else was who had to ride around the capital city on an s lord jesus christ right he comes when christ comes back he's going to be the savior of his people and he will bring peace and to reign now as we close here i just want to look at um okay some parallels okay you see some parallels right Haman and Satan, look at their ambition. Right? Remember, both of them wanted to be the greatest. Right? The need for self-glory. They had to advertise how great they were. Okay? Um, you notice their use of power? How do they use power and authority? To destroy. Right? The thief come up to kill, right? To steal and to kill. But what did Jesus say? I come to yeah, they, what uh, they will give life, and you know that, that, and that they will have life more abundantly. Here is it to destroy. You know, this something is something we need to watch for. Also, right? Any church where there's power and authority, how is it used, or how is it misused? Because does it smell like Haman? Does it smell like Satan? Then better run from that church. Okay, better run from that preacher. Okay. The rule, notice what was the rule? By fear and power. That's why when Haman was dead and, and Mordecai was re replacing, people were celebrating. Right? Um, their wicked plan both backfired and both will lose everything. Now look at the next one. Right? Mordecai and, and the Lord Jesus Christ, right? For the first time around, you see, as a humble servant, right? Nameless. Mordecai was forgotten. All the good that he did, nobody remembered, right? It was only later, okay? That was a later time where he will be honored. Now, the second time, weapons both will be in glory, power, and victory, authority, and victory. Okay? What did both do, right? Mordecai was prepared, right? Everything he did was to, he took a lot of risk to, for the sake 
right? To the point of sacrificing himself potentially for the lives of his people, right? What did the Lord Jesus Christ do? He laid down his life, right? That others might have eternal life, right? The power and authority was used to save lives, not to destroy lives, right? And both submitted to their head, right? Whether it was to the King Ezraus or to the Heavenly Father, you know, that's what they did. Now, uh, whereas Haman, just like Satan, what, the, what do they want to do? They're not accountable to anybody. They can do as they like. And guess what? I've seen spiritual leaders who are like that who don't want to be accountable, right? Who are afraid to speak in a church meeting in, on the microphone, lest they be recorded. Why? Shouldn't you be consistent, whether in private or outside or whatever? What, what do you have to hide? Okay? And so as we wrap up, yeah, uh, do we, okay, some closing thoughts. God overthrew the enemies. Right, he took care of that. He promoted Mordecai after getting rid of a Haman. Okay, those laws were reversed. Okay, God granted rights to the Jews, right? But they have to, it's up to them to exercise those rights. Is there any more? No. All right. And so, as we close here, what is interesting is this throughout the book of Esther, the one thing you do not see is the name of God mentioned. And yet, do we see the hand of God present? Yes. Right? And I, I think in many ways, you know why? To a people, this, this happened to a people who up to this point have not, many of them in Israel had not fully acknowledged, right? Uh, God, right? Had not acknowledged that he is their God and all, all that they are in captivity. But God is showing himself mighty. God is showing himself that, you know, he can still, he, he doesn't, forget his covenant, his promises to his people.